Your host is the Canton Small Business Development Center, and joining us to introduce our presenters and lead things off is Angela Smith, Assistant Director for the SUNY Canton SBDC. With that, I will jump off here and hand things over to Angela. All right, thank you so much, Renee. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, as uh, Renee mentioned, my name is Angela Smith, and I work with the SUNY Canton Small Business Development Center. We have two locations to serve the North Country, one in Canton, um, and one at Clinton Community College. So I'm really pleased to host uh, this morning's webinar. We have some incredible guest speakers, including uh, the New York State Restaurant Association, Heartland Payment Systems, and our very own uh, Christy from the North Country Chamber. Whoop. Let me make sure my PowerPoint works. Okay. So the hospitality and restaurant industry is under tremendous stress. But restaurant people are also incredibly quick to adapt and innovate in a changing environment. We wanted to team up today to bring you some industry updates and also to share some positive stories of how restaurants in our area are adjusting in times of crisis. We also wanted to take some time to make you aware of some of the resources that are available to help you through this. So as I mentioned, we're in really great company today. And I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. So first up is Melissa Fleischen. She's the president and CEO of the New York State Restaurant Association. Melissa will share some industry updates with us and also some stories of how restauranters are adapting across the state. Up next, we have Andy Carroll and Dan Berlitich from Heartland Payment Systems. They will share customer trends and also information on contactless technology and online systems. And then we have Christy Kennedy, who is the VP of Marketing and Business Development with the North Country Chamber, who's gonna talk about some of the great work the Chamber's been doing and also talk about their Shop Local, Dine Local initiative. And I'll just um, kind of talk a little bit throughout the presentation to share some stories of local ingenuity and again, as I mentioned towards the end, just a list of resources available to you guys. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome our first guest speaker, Melissa, President and CEO of the New York State Restaurant Association. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you, Angela. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so I wanted to take a few minutes and walk you through uh, the New York State Restaurant Association, who we are and what we do. I am president and CEO, as Angela said. Um, I have been now for seven years, but I've been at the association for thanks, um, 21 years. <laughs> so um, wow. I've worn a lot of hats and done a lot of jobs here, including selling membership um, in the area we're discussing, as well as being director of government affairs. So lots of advocacy work and um, should be able to answer a lot of your questions today, or at least I hope so. Um, so who we are, this is all about us. Um, our mission is to help restaurateurs succeed. Um, Pre-COVID, during COVID, post-COVID, um, it's kind of changed a little bit. We, we think that's a little bit more about helping restaurateurs survive right now, um, but helping restaurateurs succeed has always been our mission. And our vision is to be the first place that you turn to um, for all your needs, really, advocacy, education, cost-saving benefits, um, we look at it across four pillars, helping you grow your business, save you money, advocate on your behalf, and protect your business. Um, that's changed a little bit during the crisis. Obviously, advocacy has become an even bigger focus of the organization, although it's always been a primary focus of who we are. Um, but we have had to put more and more energy into advocate, as you can well imagine. Protect goes to a lot of our training programs. We have Serve Safe, um, which is a nationally recognized program for food safety, alcohol awareness, sexual harassment training, all those good things. Um, grow is just growing your business. Anything that grows your business in an education platform is falling under that pillar. And then our safe programs are um, our cost saving benefits to our members. Primarily workers comp, our safety group is our number one program but we also endorse Heartland Payment Solutions. So Andy Carroll and I are, are longtime friends here. So um, we do have a partnership with the National Restaurant Association as well. And um, so we are able to advocate at the national level through our national partner and offer a lot of programming 
through them as well. And we are a statewide trade association. So similar to Christy running the chamber, our, our organization is very similar. It's just restaurant specific. Um, we like to say we represent restaurants from Montauk to Messina and Brooklyn to Buffalo. So um, we cover the whole state and restaurant in the broadest sense. Um, so pizzerias, diners, fine dining, casual restaurants, caterers, country clubs, hotel restaurants, you name it, food and beverage wise, and you can be a part of the New York State Restaurant Association. Um, for an industry update, let's go on to the next slide. Thank you. So pre-COVID, um, the industry employed 660,000 people, according to the New York State Department of Labor. Annual sales were estimated to be about 51 billion. So it was a very big industry across the state of New York, as you can imagine, with 50,000 locations statewide, 27,000 being in New York City. Um, so life was good, numbers were high, everything was fine until COVID. And then obviously things changed. So the industry has been impacted dramatically. Um, the National Restaurant Association's research department estimates that one out of six restaurants are closed currently. Um, whoop, thank you. <laughs> um, and we're currently at about two thirds of um, our employment level um, from pre-COVID. So, Still not back to 100%, not there yet. Obviously, all the restrictions on um, indoor dining and capacity and things like that have made it difficult to get back to full level of sales, full level of staff. Those sorts of things are all impacting those numbers. Um, and just to give you a sense of how big of a hit it was in the beginning, $3.6 billion uh, loss for April when basically all we had was takeout and delivery and $1.9 billion loss in March. So just those two months alone was over $5 billion to the industry just here in New York, not, not the rest of the country. So our numbers have been pretty significant. Um, we did a survey in late August that said 90% of our survey respondents said they would not be profitable for the next six months. So that put us out to like March of 2021. So um, they have been incredibly, um, agile and very um, smart to look at new ways to survive and try to figure out ways to become um, more cost effective, cutting costs and, and ways to get through this. But the fact that they won't be profitable for another four months is going to make it a very long winter, obviously. Um, and we've been dealing with a lot of, of changes to the industry. Um, I talked to an operator the other day who said the hospitality industry doesn't feel very hospitable anymore. Um, so, you know, that's a struggle, obviously, dealing with curfews and gathering limits, um, all the guidelines for the industry. But um, we're happy to help answer questions or get you through those questions, uh, those guidelines if you have issues. Um, Microcluster strategy seems to be where we are right now, and I would argue it's a good strategy for the North Country because your numbers seem to be some of the lowest in the state. And um, yeah, yeah, keep it up. It's great. It's great news to hear. Um, and if they can keep to the microcluster strategy, now that they're adding additional metrics from hospitalizations and things like that, um, that means that you know, your restaurants will be able to stay open while others unfortunately will have to close. So fingers crossed that your numbers stay good and that we stick to a micro cluster strategy for the next few months. What we could do to help. All right, let's get into it. So um, like I said, through the National Restaurant Association, we work on federal advocacy. And this is what they have come up with um, as their blueprint for recovery and what they are focused on, um, creating a restaurant recovery fund. So way back in April, they identified the need for a specific restaurant industry recovery fund, and they put the price tag on that at about $240 billion. Um, since then, legislation has been in, introduced called the Restaurants Act that would provide a $120 billion dedicated um, fund it's obviously not as much as we think we need, but it's a start. And it's certainly a lot of money considering what Congress is actually talking about providing in a recovery package. So um, a dedicated restaurant recovery fund is something we're working on. 
Additional um, PPP money would be fantastic. The payroll protection program, we would like to see additional funding there. Um, a second round for those who may have already received it or and the opportunity for those who didn't receive it the first round to get it now if they would like. Um, we think that's very important. Um, deductibility of eligible expenses paid with PPP is a tax issue that we're working on. We think that's an important one. Um, as Congress looks at how PPP was handled and used, um, we don't want those items to have to be taxable. Um, Long-term program beyond PPP for you know, the next six months of operating expenses would be great. Um, and again, a grant program over a loan program is always a better way for us to, to help our businesses that are, are, are part of the, uh, the program here. Um, expanded employee retention tax credit, is one of the items that they would like to see enacted. Replenish funding for the EIDL loans, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. We'd love to see more funding there. We had members that took advantage of that. Provide customer and wellness tax credits. So this would be tax credits for things that you had to use for um, personal protective equipment in your business, either for your employees or your guests. Um, everybody's been you know, buying hand sanitizer and getting thermometers, and some people have gotten apps and software and things like that to track um, the health data that for their employees. So all of those things could go into a tax credit like that. I know we had a question about this. Um, business interruption insurance is something that we're looking at um, primarily at the federal level. There is some state legislation introduced on this as well. But we think that um, the federal government is best suited to address this um, since it is an insurance issue and the insurance companies would likely need to have a backstop if um, they were overdrawn on all the claims. But it is a very interesting thing to talk about and we can get into this more or even offline, somebody can contact me about it. Um, but business interruption insurance would obviously go a long way in helping a lot of the businesses that were shut down due to COVID restrictions, um, be able to pay for all their expenses and then have the insurance companies, if they needed it, have a federal fund that could support them and get them through it too. So business interruption insurance at the federal level is an important um, item for us to deal with. Um, temporary and targeted liability protection. Again, this would just be to prevent any sort of frivolous lawsuit um, at the federal level. It's, it's something we're looking at at the state level as well. Um, nothing that would limit um, bad actors from being held accountable, but just really frivolous lawsuits right now is the last thing a business needs. Um, our small business owner just can't afford to even, even put up the fight right now or settle the claim. So that would be really helpful. And then um, prioritizing testing and vaccine distribution. This is something that um, is new to us and really not something we've ever weighed in on before, but the National Restaurant Association has really gone in to say that the food supply chain at all levels needs to be um, supported and protected. And obviously after, you can see after healthcare workers, after first responders and after vulnerable populations, we feel that it would be an appropriate place to put the food service workers in the plan for who gets, who gets vaccinated and when. And I know that was a lot, so. <laughs> Um, at the state level, we're continuing to work on alcohol to go. Alcohol to go is um, authorized right now by the governor in an executive order that renews pretty much every 30 days. Um, we would like to see a more permanent solution to that for um, the state legislature to deal with when they come back into session, hopefully next month. Um, again, we support a microcluster strategy to address spikes in a limited area instead of an entire region being shut down or the entire state being shut down. So that's something that we're going to continue to support and advocate for. Um, outdoor dining, we worked really hard to get outdoor dining included in phase, I guess back in the day, it was phase 2.5. Um, so it was before indoor dining opened in phase three, but all the restrictions and the red tape that the state liquor authority cut through for us and all the local governments worked on to make this really seamless and work very well in certain areas. Um, you know, we're gonna continue to push on that program for 2021 because we think it's still gonna be important because of consumer confidence to have that outdoor dining option um, available throughout 2021. Um, everybody hates the curfew in the industry. Um, we understand why, you know, the governor has, has done this. Um, all of our neighboring states now have curfews as well. Um, and that's where they got the idea from. But 
you know, we know it, make, it makes it extremely difficult. So elimination of the curfew as soon as it's, it makes sense from a health perspective um, and other restrictions and then set metrics for when we can, you know, start to get out of this and what the numbers need to look like in order for the restrictions to be lifted. And then we have to really carefully watch the 2021 budget negotiations at the state level. The state has already explained um, its financial situation and, and how long they expect the economic impact of COVID to continue to affect the budget. I think right now it's, it's expected to be for the next four years um, to the state budget. So we just need to watch their revenue raisers and make sure that there's not a lot of new fees, penalties, costs, or taxes put on the hospitality industry. Um, communications wise, this is what we did um, and are still dealing with at the association. Um, if you have questions, you can send them to info at nizer.org. If you'd like to be added to any of our mailing lists, we do allow non-members to be part of our mailing list right now. We still send out a weekly update to any non-members. Um, information about joining and what the member benefits are can be found at nizer.org. Um, we do a nightly update uh, Monday through Friday for our members. It's one of the most uh, well-received benefits that we put out there right now. It is weekly for non-members, so you can certainly um, access that if you'd like to. We've done operator Zoom calls from around the state. We've done regional calls. We've done um, industry-specific calls. We have like a caterer's call uh, later today at 11 o'clock where we deal specifically with their issues because they're really struggling um, to, to be able to hold events at such limited numbers right now. Um, and we hold a couple operator calls a week. And um, then our Zoom webinars we've been doing throughout and they're open to members and non-members as well. After the fact, they're only um, the recordings are only available to members, but those are some of the topics that we dealt with in the, the early days um, and we continue to do Gosh, I don't know, probably two a week. Um, so it's it's a it's an extensive program of education, um, and we're always willing to take on new ideas and, and new options. New ways to adapt. So um, I just tried to pick three ideas um, here of what we thought some of the interesting things happening out there in the industry were. Um, the first one comes from Hamburg, New York, out near Buffalo. Um, we had a member who really quickly was able to organize his neighbors um, across the town of Hamburg and the local restaurants came together, which I always love to see them work together as a community instead of looking at each other as competitors when they can. Um, and they worked with the local government to get parking spaces dedicated for curbside pickup. So, no one's allowed to park there unless they're picking up curbside pickup from one of the local businesses on the street. And they have a really seamless project where you show up. Um, originally, I don't, I don't think they still do it, but originally they had like um, your name on the, your, your car window. They would have you put a sign up in your window to tell them which car you were. Um, so it was very contactless. It was very um, easy right from the beginning. They did this way back in March. Um, and we're able to really make a go of it with takeout and delivery, which I think is super important to everybody. Um, you know, it's so important to figure it out. If you need help figuring it out, I know there's many people out in the industry that we could connect you with to make this um, as painless as possible, but, you know, try to figure out a way to do it. Even if it's one dish that's super popular at your restaurant, um, there's gotta be a way to make it work because right now, as the numbers climb, we are seeing consumer confidence start to slip again. Um, stock the freezer, this was an idea, again, from one of our uh, Buffalo members who has a fine dining restaurant that just didn't see the clientele coming back into the restaurant um, at the levels that he wanted to and didn't feel that his product traveled very well. So stock the freezer became his way to do it. So they cook their homemade meals, they freeze them quickly and um, take them out and deliver them so that you can have them and enjoy them at your time and your convenience at your house. Um, so we thought this was a great idea and he's looking to expand it to other restaurants and, and get them on the site and the platform as well. And then um, feed the front lines. There's been a couple of people who, um, who have done this. So um, as soon as I shared this with one of my staff members, they're like, don't forget in Albany, it's, you know, Jonas has been doing this and I'm like, right. Um, Dominic Pernomo has been doing a great job with Feed Albany here in Albany, New York. Um, Feed the Front Lines is actually in New York City with one of our members down there. 
where they are um, working to, to feed food insecure and healthcare workers. So they've been delivering meals to hospitals throughout the pandemic um, and, you know, nothing better than that. Nothing better than actually, you know, making sure that the, the care and the love that we share in the hospitality industry is given back to those who are on the front lines. So those are three ideas of um, ways that people have pivoted and changed their, their business model to try and get through this. And locally also, thanks, Melissa. You guys are doing so much. Um, I wasn't aware of the huge list of things you advocate for for the industry as well. So we're really lucky to have a strong presence in New York State uh, with your association advocating for the restaurant industry. So on behalf of everybody, thank you for the work that you do. Um, locally, I wanted to highlight a few stories as well. Um, some of my favorites include, um, you know, when sometimes it takes a village to solve problems. Um, so in Saratoga Springs, the chamber, town officials, and businesses all came together and they added parklets around Main Street, taking up some green spaces and parks and also some parking spots to allow restaurants to expand their outdoor dining seating spaces. And that allowed for, you know, beyond the sidewalks and also their, their own deck. So this allowed for expanded outdoor dining and also uh, to improve social distancing. If you love bacon, you'll love this next story. So. Oscar's Smokehouse recently unveiled they have a bacon vending machine. Um, so if the store's too busy and people don't feel comfortable going outside, they can access product through the vending machine. And I guess meat and cheese is available 24 hours a day. So um, if you're in the mood at midnight for uh, some Oscar's cheese, it is available to you. Locally, much like uh, Melissa was saying, neighbors helping neighbors. We have a great story right here in Plattsburgh with Aleka's, um, who is a Greek restaurant that got some bad news that they had, um, they were no longer able to operate out of their kitchen. And, um, you know, very quickly a neighboring business, uh, Ridley's Tap House, Olive and Ridley's Tap House, opened up their doors to them. So now we have two restaurants operating in one kitchen serving customers. So that's just an incredible story of, of local support and that's what restaurants are all about. And finally, in Lake Placid, the Cottage Cafe at Mirror Lake Inn, um, they're doing some fun stuff as well where they've repurposed some old ski gondolas for outdoor dining. So that's a pretty unique experience to be able to sit in a repurposed gondola in Lake Placid. So I um, thought that was very fitting. Other examples of local ingenuity might be that we'll just have to learn to love our assets, right? So colder weather and outdoor dining are really not thought of as being compatible, but this is our reality here in the North Country. So what if we turn this challenge into an opportunity to put our region on the map and embrace winter? Um, the restaurant industry is known and the hospitality industry is known, right, for providing clients with unique experiences. And we've seen some businesses that are setting up igloos and yurt spaces, and they're actually renting those out for $25 to $75 an hour to clients. Um, others are building fire pits with outdoor seating and blankets. Um, so is there some ideas, some low cost ideas that we can implement, right, uh, such as building an ice bar or, you know, adding seating to some of the parks and parking spots if you create parklets in your own communities. Um, you know, I think we could start a trend where outdoor dining is actually something that people might, you know, look forward to talking about consumer confidence. Um, I think people um, may be ready to go outside and, you know, have a meal or a drink, but inside might be something that is uh, a little bit scarier to them. So this could be a way to kind of embrace winter and see if we can leverage some of the assets we have. I'd be happy to share pictures and stories on our social media all winter long if people want to share some of the cool stuff they're doing. And I wouldn't be surprised that Bruce and Christy with the Adirondack Coast might even have plans to promote, promote some of our winter assets. So um, I'm sure we'll see some really fun stories being shared at this level uh, as we move into winter. Up next, we're going to uh, talk consumer trends and the latest innovations in contactless technology with Andy Carroll and Dan Berlitich from Heartland Payment Systems. And I think, Renee, you're going to have to 
bring up your screen for that presentation. There we go. Whoop. That. Okay, good morning. Do a little sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm Andy Carroll. I'm with Heartland Payment Systems, and I'm here with my uh, business colleague, Dan Berlitich, as well. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, it, I, I love that piece you had there, Angela. And uh, it reminds me of what someone said uh, a while ago, probably back in the spring, was um, we got to stop thinking about, you know, when are we going to get out of COVID and what can I get out of COVID? Right. What can we how can we create new ways of opportunity that will last beyond this? And I love the igloo and the here idea. I, I just think, uh, you know, and especially in upstate New York, where, you know, most people are their activities are outside. And I think that's a great idea to do it. You know, four seasons. I thought that was, that, That's awesome. Um, so Heartland Payment Systems is a payment provider. Uh, we have a strong presence in the restaurant space, uh, although we do just about every industry um, with e-commerce and billing solutions point of sale systems and things like that. Um, I'm proud to say that I am a friend of Melissa's and I sit on the one of my favorite moments of my 25 year career in the restaurant industry. Came 12 years after I left the industry. It was when I was asked to be on the board of the New York State Restaurant Association. That is my proudest restaurant moment, even beyond the first day I opened my restaurant. Um, although I do what I do because of spending that much time in the restaurant industry, and wanting uh, owners, you know, what's my role in their success? What's Heartland's role in their success? Heartland enables me to be far more effective than I ever was as a general manager, a food and beverage director, or even an owner um, with these tools that I now know. If I only knew back then what I know now, right? Um, so I really kind of do what I do because I know what it's like personally to look across the dining room and wonder if you're gonna make payroll to know that the people that you're working for you depend on my decisions every single day to feed their families. So th that's a heavy burden for restaurateurs and entrepreneurs. And, and one of Heartland's credos is entrepreneurs respectfully serving entrepreneurs. That is our credo on a lot of things that we do. Um, and it guides me um, in every appointment that I have, everywhere I go. Um, Melissa could probably attest to it in some of the board meetings and things I, I talk about, what is my role? And one of the things I often say is, when you go back to your offices and you're writing your checks and paying for things, take a look at the name you're writing on that check. And is that person a vendor or a partner? Someone that actually gives a damn that you're in business in 10 more years. What is their vested interest in your success? And so that's where we begin, right? Um, you know, we'll talk about contactless payments here because we're in COVID. Um, and like, so contactless payments have been around for a long time, but what are they, right? Does everybody know what they are? Um, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory to wear contactless, but it includes online ordering. Many people think about it being a tap to pay kind of a situation, but online ordering, text to pay, tap to pay, kiosks, QR codes at your table, you know, that will facilitate Apple Pay and Google Pay and things like that, um, and, and many other ways of, of doing it with the technology. Um, so like I said, they've been around for a long time, but the pandemic kind of brought it into mainstream, right, as a new necessity. We talked about new norm, this is really kind of a new necessity. Um, they're essential for dining, curbside, online ordering, skip the line technology, um, take out, pick up and delivery. We see it all the time when we go out and we buy. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we see that primarily in chain restaurants, right? How does it get down to Main Street, America and people that are, you know, we always talk about that the sole proprietor and the entrepreneurs and the small businesses are the ones who are hiring everybody, right? That's where all the, the you know, the employment and the good numbers come from. So how do we keep them successful? Because it's the key to our success in our communities. But I think it's important, you know, to point out that payments, contactless payments, it's really becoming the face of your restaurant now. Your owner's not always out front going table to table greeting your customers. The actual visual presence that you have online or how I'm, how I'm paying you to pick up my food right now is becoming the face of your industry, the face of your restaurant. Um, and it's, it's been, you know, it's proven to your customers that you're a safe and healthy place to go, right? It just is. Um, those are the places that consumers are now going. Where can I go where I don't have to be, you know, forced into a less than six feet environment, right? Um, but most importantly, 
uh, this technology not only helps you restart and you know or your restaurant survive, but it's actually able to grow during COVID. I see it with many of our customers, and I shared a story with uh, Angela and, and Christy yesterday. We had a, a brew pub out in uh, the Rochester area who had never taken online payments before. Really wasn't sure that they wanted to do it, and I was just sitting with him, and I said, you know, this is something you really need to do. And this was before the shutdown. I can remember it was the Monday before that Wednesday when like the NCAA and the basketball teams and all that sports really started to shut down. And that's when everything started to shut down. He was like, okay, well, let, let, let's do this. In the first week, they came out projecting in those sales in that first week of doing $640,000 a year. When this is over, he's not going to lose all that revenue. He's going to get back to the way things were when, when dine-in is in, in full swing. And that's just going to be a new revenue source for them. So that's how you can, you know, what am I going to get out of COVID? You're going to create new revenue sources. Um, the national, here's what's interesting about trends. So the National Retail Federation, which is the largest trade group, expects sales in November and December this year to increase 3.6% and 5.2% over 2019. That's about twice as much as you normally see, we've seen over the past four or five years in normal times, um, you know, compared to what was a 4%, so 5.2, now 4% from the year before. Holiday sales gains were 3.5% over the past five years. Here's where it gets interesting. On Thanksgiving Day this year, $5.1 billion, up 21.5% compared to a year ago. 21.5. And that comes from uh, Adobe Analytics. These aren't just my numbers. Um, Main Street needs to get a piece of that. What is it, right? We, don't, we can't keep going to Olive Garden or Etsy and places like that. How do we even the playing field? And it's important fact to understand that the restaurant industry experienced a negative 2% growth in dine-in revenue and an increase of 22% in revenue growth in non-dine-in, including drive-through pickup and delivery. So 22% growth non-dine-in before COVID, before that trend's existing, it's not going away. So where's your investment gonna be? Right? Dining rooms are becoming a cost center. They just are, right? People are, what are we going to get out of COVID? People are going to realize that maybe they don't need a 150 seat restaurant. Maybe we can take that extra space and turn it into a catering room only, right? Because most restaurants will realize I'm only making my money on Friday and Saturday night in most of this restaurant. So how do I book that after COVID? Maybe you're going to recognize and educate yourself on things that the real potential of your restaurant are really where the, where the worth is when you do survive, because a lot of people are now, I hear it every day, when we complain about the environment that we're in right now, but they've decided to stay open, so now what, right? Now what, what are you gonna do proactively to grow? And it's interesting that this slide here, that 60% of consumers are less likely to choose a restaurant if they can't see the menu on a mobile device, right? We say it all the time, but for some reason, the majority of Main Street brick and mortar restaurants don't have this yet. Many do, but there are way too many that don't and they're missing opportunity. 75% of millennials today, a lot of people will say, well, that's not my, those are, I know who my customers are and that's not my customers. You need to start to make sure they are because they're going to have children. They're going to be married. You need to continue to grow your customer base. People have said, my customers, everyone is your customer. <laughs> if I'm going out to eat, you need to be one of the choices. Um, and if 79% of millennials today order takeout via your website or an app, you need to do that. And don't misunderstand your older customers is that this is what they're doing. I FaceTime, my children FaceTime my mom. She was 74 years old every day. My mother uses Apple Pay. She uses text to pay. She's 74 years old. 73% of diners agree that new technology improves their guest experience and are increasingly likely to use it. That number is gonna go up. That's what I meant by that. So your, your technology is now the face of your restaurant. At least now, you know, soon you'll be able to have a hostess stand, soon you'll have somebody else out there, but right now, this is where it's at. And that 64% that wanna see you on your phone, it's the first impression. And if I don't have a nice experience online, I may not come in, right? So maybe go on the next slide, we'll see what we got here. So what does it all mean? How do I get it to work? And how do we turn it into profit, right? 
So there are many different ways to do it. I want you to close your eyes and imagine what it's like in your restaurant or as a consumer when you're picking up a pizza at 5.30 at night on a Friday and that phone just rings and rings and rings. Go to online ordering. Stop that phone from ringing because me as a consumer, I'm spending 18 to 23% more when I'm doing it online because you do not have the time to suggest a sell to me. You got pizzas out coming out of the oven. You got food waiting to be picked up in, in full service restaurants. It's the same thing. You're trying to package everything up, trying to keep it safe, trying to keep it hot so it travels well. You're missing the customer experience. And this, the average increased spend with an online order is 18 to 23% more. That is significant growth in your restaurant. Significant. You need to capitalize on that. Um, and that can, how does this all, what does it mean in your restaurant when that order comes in, right? You do not lose control, you gain control. Now you can control the number of orders you take in 15, 20 minutes to a half an hour. You're in control of that. You can decide how quickly you're gonna be able to turn these things over. And you can do it by days of the week now. You can do it during two hour increments. You can do it by the size of the order. Instead of having, hey, your board will be ready in 20 minutes. Well, if I did put a $150 order in, I'm gonna need 45 minutes. You have those controls as an entrepreneur. And you need to make sure that when you take these orders, that everything is omni-channel. When I was talking about your partners and not vendors, many of you have purchased a point of sale system or technology that began and end right there when it got installed. There's no support afterwards of anyone taking that time to understand where you're going. You need to be in a relationship with a this vendor, partner, that can grow with your business, right? That can take you to the next level. It might be just a cash register today, but tomorrow it might be a contact, contactless payment solution, whether it be a pickup kiosk or online ordering. And how is it all omnichannel? In case you don't know, omnichannel means you're able to accept your orders over multiple devices, all connected. So your point of sale system, somebody's phone, an iPad, things like that. Um, or the self-order kiosk when you walk in for quick service. This is huge. This is, I mean, you see it in Panera Bread all the time. You can walk up and you can order those things. You can do that now in your restaurant. If you're selling sandwiches right now in a quick service environment, you need to do what they're doing. Be able to have somebody come in online, put their order in, you package it very nicely. There's a real lot of creative packaging out there. And I know Melissa's worked on that many times with different people call in and how do we get that part of our industry into almost, your food is almost like a present. <laughs> My wife ordered food out last night and it came in a really nice box. It was really well prepared. Um, and so how that is all tied in, the self-ordering kiosk, what happens when you put that order in? You're capturing a name and contact information. So you, to, so you want to be able to have make your customers come in, your solutions, have your customers come in more often and spend more when they do and be able to reach them in a meaningful way when you are not around, right? Three o'clock in the afternoon, eight o'clock in the morning, you know, when they're driving home from work at warm bread, right? If anyone's old enough, you, you had your neighborhood bakery, how often did you see that paper plate in the window that just says warm bread at four o'clock, right? And you thought, oh, I'm going to get some warm Italian bread before I go home. There's nothing better than that. It's becoming that small town feel again. Uh, people are shopping local. You've got to find a way to get your share of that $5.1 billion that's being spent online. Imagine if you could just get another $10,000 to the bottom line of that $5.1 billion. What's your share in that? And you need to embrace the technology to do it. You need to get in the consumer's phones and consumer's iPads and in their email address every day and what's going on in your restaurant. We talk a lot about we're doing this already with different apps and different things like that with the delivery services. Uh, that's a, I, have, um, I'm, I would say I'm agnostic to any delivery services or any on ordering. It's your decision for your, for your restaurant. My advice is that only pay someone if they're driving business to your restaurant. Get out of the practice of people going to a website, your website, clicking on a buy now and leaving your website and going to some other website that's promoting other restaurants. That is the only real flaw that I see. I, I wanna kind of knock something down. And I know we talk about the fees for delivery services, which isn't as prevalent in the North country and it is necessary in New York City. These are your partners. When people 
your, my competitors do this all the time to say, well, 30% is a little high. It might be 20% now, not better. That's also less than labor. <laughs> so be careful of the math. Be careful how you're being steered. You got to do what's best for your business. And I'm, I'm in that regard, I'm kind of a proponent for those delivery services and paying them to do it as long as it makes sense mathematically for your business and your bottom line. Um, so I want to kind of just put that out there. Um, the guest applications are very, very important. So if you can get a reservation system where you can have your guests check in. So if you got that out there doing like in Saratoga, I'm coming in half an hour for a table. Lake Placid, this is huge. You want to get out and you walk around the lake and things like that. You want them to go hiking, you're cross country skiing, you're doing whatever with a lot of these outdoor th things you're doing. And to be able to text to say your table will be ready in 20 minutes. You're doing a lot for the community right there. You're getting these guests back out in the community spending money where my good customers that are waiting for a reservation right now, your good customers where they're buying a scarf or doing other things like that. You're working together, right? It's just down the street. And Saratoga is perfect for it. Plasper is perfect for it. Lake Plas is perfect for it. Um, all over New York, the Finger Lakes, all those places are perfect for this type of technology. So go ahead, go shop, go next door, go buy a bottle of wine. You know, do those things and we will text you when your table is ready. You're also gonna text them next time they come into town. <laughs> and you're gonna say, hey, welcome back because these things have geo trekking. When they walk by your restaurant, they're gonna get a little, a little uh, text message or an email depending on how you wanna be, uh, your consumer wants to, to be contacted. That's where, the, that's where when these people say contactless payment, it goes far beyond tap to pay, right? Far beyond that kind of stuff. It is a marketing tool. I was telling Christy yesterday, it drives me crazy when I walk into a restaurant and I used to do it mine. I used to mow my own lawn. It was one time when I was peaceful, but geez, for another $240, it took me, what could I have done with that hour and a half, right? What could I have done? What if I joined a chamber? What if I went from, from table or uh, store to store with my gift cards and said, hey, next time somebody comes in for a haircut, give them $5, tell them your beer's on me, soda's on me, and appetizer's on you, right? That's unheard of. That's getting one merchant's customers, good customers becoming your good customers. That is contactless payment, right? They even know it's just a gift card. Now it's a loyalty program, all tied in together, all in their phones. This is the contactless environment we're in now. We got to think beyond just shoving your credit card into a machine. It's far beyond that. And that's where the partnership goes. What do we have on the next slide? I can't remember some of the things that we were having here. I could go on and on. I don't even need these things. Oh, there's kiosks. We already did all that. We can probably go through that. Um, am I done? My 50 minutes up. Okay, I gotta keep going. Um, so, so this is really cool. Go through a couple slides here because I want to talk about one of my experiences that I think is is very um, powerful. I did talk about the this uh, you know the, the different rich features that these things have, and you can see the icons on the back with you know your truck and, and things like that. But table side ordering, delivery dispatch. Um, where is it? See that graphical seating. So what's nice about online ordering now is if we go through, maybe one more slide, <clears throat> I think is, is where it might be. Matt, it doesn't matter. Um, so I was in a restaurant in Lake Placid and you have QR code readers now you can get in your phone. Here we go. So not only can you order online and then pick up your food and then pay with a QR code that's on the receipt that you get and you just scan it and do it. There are very few people that don't have this ability on their phone, a QR code reader. You're using it for checking prices in the market, in, the, in, the, in, the, in your clothing stores you go to and things like that. There's no cost for this to your consumers, but you can also introduce them to it when they come into your restaurant. It takes nothing to add this app to your phone when you're in there. But here's the neat thing that happens with that. Putting a QR code on the table tent in your menu, we talked forever in the industry about how to keep your restaurant safe. <clears throat> Your restaurant will be busier if you can prove that you have a safe, healthy environment for your customers and welcoming them to go the way that only restaurateurs can welcome somebody. No one does it better than you. No one is better at hospitality than you. So when you go in these restaurants, you have a QR code. There's many restaurants that are doing it right now. And I scan that, that QR code, I see their menu on a PDF though. So imagine if that actually went to your website. It was now omnichannel, now integrated in there. Instead of delivering to my home address, which is what a website does, right? When you're ordering, you're delivering table 12, seat number four, right? 
and you got everybody putting their order in there. Now you're turning your servers, they're keeping them out in the dining room, they're selling more drinks, they're seeing how everybody's doing, they're monitoring, making sure people are wearing masks. It's a much more friendly, less hectic atmosphere. So this technology can go with pickup, takeout, ordering kiosk, and paying at the table. No checks being delivered. No menus need to be cleaned down or, or PDFs going, and it's all integrated. What you know about those PDFs and they're still reading, the server still has to come over. There's still things that need to be ordered. The table turn is reduced by 20 minutes on a normal two hour dining period when you can check out. You've seen them out in the industry called Ziosk, those little screens around the thing that kids could play with the games and stuff on it. But the fact that you were able to order dessert and pay your check before the server came over, who now had five or six tables, <coughs> you were out. You were, your table time turns were faster. If you could get two or three more tables in in one shift, this is how you got to kind of maximize your your restaurants. You're doing this all the time. How do I maximize seating in this place when you don't really there's nothing you could do? You got to be six feet apart. Well, it's it's turning the tables, right? It's trying to figure out how can I get one more half of the seating into the day. Like if I've got to do that, how can I do it, right? So these are the technologies that allow you to do that, to monitor the seating times, to speed up that turn times. Maybe you take, um, instead of walk-ins, you take you know reservations and you start saying, well, you can't come in at 6.30, you gotta come in at 5.30. You gotta come in at quarter six because I need to sit you at seven. And I need to sit you again at 8.30 because after eight, 8.30, I'm not getting anybody. So you're maximizing at least maybe a half of a dining room and the technology will help you understand your table times and when you can seat people and when you can't. I think that's just about it. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it sounds overwhelming. But that's why I want to say, you know, you partner with people like Melissa, who have vetted out these different partners that are out there. We're Heartland Payment Systems is the only company that does this stuff. But you got to know that someone is sitting in a desk somewhere with additional technology for you to leverage. You need to, you cannot survive alone anymore. You need to embrace partners. Absolutely. Like Andy, we did call. get a question uh, that came yeah. in from Victor. Victor is a landlord of a restaurant in the Bronx and his tenant of 25 plus years is six months behind in rent and their taxes and insurance are not going down. What do you suggest? Should I sell the property for 30% on the dollar or hope he can hold on till things get better if ever? Is that a question for me or Melissa? <laughs> I, I'm not a real estate agent, so I'm I, I I'm not going to even, I, I would be doing it a service if I. I'll shoot that about. one over to Melissa. Yeah. Uh, if any other folks have but questions. I, but I would suggest that they could get in touch. I would suggest that they get in touch maybe with Melissa or their local SBDC as well to maybe talk about strategies. Um, because without looking at data and specific situation, it's very difficult to provide good um, suggestions. So that's what so I was- In a I real general term, I guess I would have to understand, is the restaurant open? Are they doing any sales at all? Or has the restaurant been shut down the entire time? I know we've seen some success um, with some of our members who have been able to renegotiate rent as a percentage of sales. Obviously, it wouldn't get you everything that you want out of the relationship with your tenant, but you know they can only pay if they're making any money. Um, so it, it's something to think about as to how you would renegotiate it. Honestly, I we're advocating for a bigger fix to commercial rent because we understand that our our members and non-members in the restaurant industry can't pay the landlords, and then the landlords can't pay the banks. And we think there needs to be a bigger discussion and a bigger fix to the problem because it's bigger than us. And Victor did let us know that the restaurant's doing about 25% of business and they, they feel a little bit deserted by the government. The landlord, so do the restaurants. Absolutely, it's their only source of income and definitely for a lot of restaurants that's true as well. Yeah, I mean, the PPP program is probably the one that addressed rent the most um, that we've seen come out of the federal government. And as many of you know, that was pretty much an eight week solution for a year long problem is how we like to reference that. Thank you, Melissa. I to bring up my screen next to welcome Christy from the Chamber of Commerce to talk a little bit about their 
um, work that they're doing. And also we will have a block of time for questions uh, right after um, the presentation. So do keep your questions coming. Okay. Angela. You're getting so fancy there, Angela. I love it. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> the world of virtual, we never know what screen's showing and who's doing what, but it all, we always pull it off, which is awesome. And I, <laughs> I'm in awe of the way so, we've all adapted. So welcome yeah. to Christy. She's our, our very own marketing and uh, business development with the North Country Chamber, who has been doing an incredible job of disseminating information, um, you know, ever since the pandemic started um, on steroids. So welcome, Christy. And tell us, please, what are you guys working on? What are you doing to support our, our local businesses? Definitely. That's a topic I can talk on forever. So um, like uh, Angela said, I'm Christy Kennedy. I work here at the North Country Chamber of Commerce. We're located in Plattsburgh, but we really are a regional chamber of commerce. We have over 4,200 members that we do represent in the North Country area, anywhere from Clinton, Essex, Franklin counties, um, down to North Warren, into Aquasasne. So needless to say, that upper part of New York we've got covered. And just like Melissa was saying, our real focus as soon as um, the pandemic hit and New York on pause took place was really, we need to get information to people. We need to make it so it's digestible for our small businesses to really understand it. Um, we know a lot of them are either sole proprietors, they're not used to government lingo, they're not sure how it all works. We were a staff of 13 who was struggling with it and this is something we do every day. So really at the beginning of the pandemic, we started out with um, really, understanding guidelines, what this meant, what funding was available, how are you going to stay and survive. Um, as it's gone on, we really began to understand that um, every sector of our membership was kind of being affected differently. Um, small businesses and retail sector were a little bit different than maybe our restaurants that were um, maybe our manufacturing businesses, which are very um, prevalent up in our, our membership. So when we were looking at our tourism angle, more of our restaurants, our shopping, the real message kind of was twofold. Um, it was, yes, shop local and dine local and educating the community that dining local didn't just mean utilizing their outdoor seating or their um, indoor dining, but also to dine local and support local and support our restaurants meant um, going and doing takeout, getting delivery, using other means to still support them. Um, for the caterers, like Melissa said, you know, if you're having a small family gathering, even if it's for consider, you know, picking up food from those local caterers. So it was really started out as an education of how to shop local and dine local and what it meant. And then the messaging also went to how it impacts um, the community at large, that how these restaurants and you dining local or shopping local really affected our community's quality of life. It's not just, oh, it's great we have this restaurant, it's great that we have um, this shop. It, it's really those members, those neighbors make our life better. They give us the amenities we need to survive. So um, we wanted to get that out there. The other thing that we were noticing was, um, I'll backtrack a minute. My favorite story is people, um, obviously, because we're a Canadian border community, um, and this is totally anecdotal, but Applebee's, we have an Applebee's in our community. And while it's maybe not a locally, it's a franchise business, everyone's always like, oh, I never want to go to Applebee's. There's, there's so many Canadians at the bar. You can't get a place at the bar. And that comment really is a way to spark a conversation because the reason we have an Applebee's and we have a lot of the restaurants and retail facilities is because of that traffic count and because of that border fluidity and those visitors. And we wouldn't be able to have a lot of the amenities that we've grown to love if we didn't have this influx of people. And so it was really that education that our quality of life depends on 
these local experiences. So we need to step up and support them and that's how they stay open. Um, and it was also helping to send some messaging around fear. There was fear to go back into a restaurant. There was fear to go back into a retail facility. Um, do I have to wear a mask? What's the mask policy? How is it sanitized? What are the protocols? Am I going to be at risk? What are they doing? So a lot of what we found out is we needed to center our campaigns around messaging of, you know, what you need to do be before you walk in the facility, what you can expect from that facility. So we teamed up with some local media partners as well as harnessing the uh, power of social media, as I like to say, and we talked to our local vendors. And we got quotes um, from them about what they're doing. What are you doing to keep your um, customers safe? What are you offering that we can put out there? Um, and then we also even went on, and this was a, a great thing that kind of happened organically. We went on Google reviews and we saw that a lot of local residents were putting reviews on that spoke to sanitation practices, to their experience during COVID, how they were supporting them. So we were able to kind of take those and amplify that review and say, it's not the store owner, it's not the restaurant or the general manager who's saying, oh, we're safe, we're safe. But no, other people, other customers who have um, gone to the uh, establishment are, are telling you a testimonial. And really we know the power of a testimonial. You're more likely to go somewhere, shop somewhere if someone you trust, um, if you says, oh, I had a great experience, you definitely need to check it out, this, this, that, here's a picture um, of me there having a great dessert. Um, anything with chocolate will lure me in just so you know. So if you ever post a picture of somewhere and it's got an amazing dessert, I will go. So I, I marketing works on me. Um, so we knew those pictures would help and those testimonials. Um, so we really did this messaging campaign about the importance of shopping local, dining local, what it meant, all the different facets that you can do as well, um, and education. So that's running on the North Country Chamber social media. Like I said, we have it in the local newspaper. We have web, our website dedicated to it. We even developed a website, ADK Coast Eats, which just lists all of our dining establishments, um, updated information on hours, maybe different things you need to think about, like um, practices they've put into place, just so everyone's prepared. And it takes that fear and unknown out of going and dining in, um, in restaurant, as well as just the understanding that it's still safe and okay. On the other end of that, we have another campaign that we've kind of partnered with it, and it's called Mask Up North Country. We knew going into the holidays that um, COVID fatigue was getting, was a real thing. It sounds kind of hooky in a marketing term, but it is. People kind of got off in the summer where the numbers were low up, up in this community, um, up in this region, and they were kind of getting like, oh, it, it's going away. But what we saw is what we expected, that fall was going to be an uptick of cases, and we've seen that. And really, we needed to do some messaging around the idea that not just about wearing a mask and how it helps prevent, again, your it's great for your health and wellness of the community, but if you do not take these social um, practices, again, that's going to lead to major um, problems. You're going to see things shut down. You're going to see restaurants who can't afford another shutdown and won't open. So again, that idea that if you don't do your part, your quality of life is going to suffer when we get to the other side of this. Um, so we partnered with our local United Way, um, regional chambers, our partner chambers and their um, staff as uh, as well, the Plattsburgh YMCA came on board, a lot of just our local restaurants and our um, shopping facilities all sent us pictures, you can see them on the bottom half of this slide, with a quote on what it would mean and why it's important that we continue to um, battle this COVID fatigue and, and really do our part. And what it means is the bigger messaging of the community. It was never just a, it was the messaging was very much like how does it how is this going to affect your life? Yes, right now our restaurants are suffering. We need to get around them. But remember, 
doing this now and taking these precautions is going to allow you um, are, are going to allow you to enjoy the life that you've once known. And what's really great is the North Country, as you all know, is an incredible community. It's in a region like no other. We're very close knit. We have strong roots and generational um, families. I mean, I'm a generation third generation from this area. I love it. I left and came back because it's that strong. Um, so we really saw our community members rally behind this, you know, the idea of I'm going to get my local coffee every morning from the coffee shop because they've donated and they've sponsored my kids baseball team. I'm going to go and show them that support. So um, it was it's really nice. It's nice to see how it very organically took hold. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk to anybody about it. My contact information is in the top of that slide, and Angela always knows how to get a hold of me. Um, and as always, we are a Chamber of Commerce who has a bit of a different um, role. You know, we definitely do a lot of government advocacy and affairs. We do, obviously, uh, a lot of health insurance. We really combated that um, during COVID. So if you have any questions about the Chamber in general, of course, reach out to me. But this is really about that campaign, and I'm happy to talk to whoever would like some more information. Thank you so much, Christy. And again, the daily dose that I know it's a ton of work to publish that, you know, initially it was every day and now I think you're doing it bi-weekly, but the information that was shared on that newsletter is just incredibly helpful to multiple, multiple businesses. Yeah. Across I, I would like to just throw out, Angela, about the daily dose. If um, we do send it out twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays now, and as Melissa said, ours is going out to non-members for the first time as well. So if you're not receiving it and you would like to be on the mailing list, just have the email address that Angela has for me. Have, send along your email. I'd be happy to add you to the list so you're staying up to date on a lot of the things we're deciphering to. Absolutely. And it's a great segue to kind of finish with, you know, there are resources out there for you. You don't have to be alone going through this. In New York State, with the Small Business Development Center, we have 22 centers across the state that are here to assist small businesses in different capacities, whether it's helping you review a budget, helping you to get online. Um, you know, we were talking yesterday, Andy and I, about maybe we'll do uh, Get Your Restaurant Online Weekend Boot Camp together. So there are many things that the SBDC can do for you. Our services are free of charge and confidential. There is funding around. Yes, a lot of it is loans, but there's small micro loan programs. Anka has a program called Ignite, which is a crowdfunding. So if you need to spend $3,000, $5,000 on a new piece of equipment, something maybe, you know, something cool you want to do to bump up your outdoor dining this winter, um, there are uh, different programs available. And contact me, uh, the SBDC. I'm sure Christy's aware of a lot of programs as well economic development agencies and in, in various counties everybody has a loan program um, a covid specific program they're super low interest going out 10 years there's a new york board there's still money in the ideal so there's a lot of resources out there yes i know we want to see more grants i am hopeful that more of those will be coming um, there's not a ton uh, out there that i know of right at this moment um, again, there's the SCORE uh, also, which the Chamber is hosting, uh, so there's SCORE volunteers available to you. Melissa has, you know, incredible, uh, opened up the webinars to non-members and also, uh, you know, doing a similar daily dose on a weekly basis if you're not a member, but consider joining and becoming part of the network because what we've seen during COVID is we saw an uptick of uh, about six months worth of clients contacting us in the span of a few weeks. And when you are networked in with people like the Chamber, the SBDC, the New York State Restaurant Association, Heartland, you are going to get access to information before anybody else. And it'll allow you, hopefully, to make better decisions and also reach out, for example, when PPP came out and, and tap into some of these funding before it's all gone. So I would say as a New Year's resolution, make sure that you expand your network. Every business has an accountant and an insurance agent. We'll add the New York State Restaurant Association, the Chamber, and the SBDC to that network as well. 
And um, without any further ado, I would like to open it up to some questions. And um, got a cool picture here of one of our uh, IDAs in Franklin County with uh, Amada restaurant owners in Tupper Lake, and they were able to tap into some loan funds to build some cabins slash tents to extend their down their outdoor dining. But Renee, if you can uh, let us know if anybody has questions to ask the panelists, I'd be glad to open it up. Absolutely. We have a few that came in. I'll also mention Andy had to jump off, but we still have Dan on. So if you have questions about payment systems, Dan's here to help out with those. Um, this first one might be a cross between Melissa and Christy addressing. Um, so uh, let me see if I can summarize this properly. Um, it's really hard to, to, to watch a panel and hear the talk about the situation. Um, Victor feels what we really need is money. Um, are there things the Chamber of Commerce is doing or the Restaurant Association? I know, Melissa, you mentioned some of these that are pressuring our government to get money out to the small person. And what do you think life as we've once know it, uh, do you anticipate that coming back? Okay, there's a lot to unpack in that. Um, so I guess, you know, as far as money goes and funding, we really feel that the, the federal level is the way we have to go. We have to look at the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House of Representatives, um, and either the current presidency or the president-elect. Um, we have to get this done, and the sooner the better. We have been advocating for months that the industry needed um, more relief from the federal government. Um, we started our push back in July for a second round of PPP um, and for additional funding. It's been, as you know, I guess quagmire, quagmire is the word I would use to describe it, but um, it's been extremely challenging to get any kind of agreement out of Congress at this point. There is a very small window where they may come to some agreement over the next few days while they're still working on um, budget issues and continuing resolutions at the federal level for the federal budget. Um, if that window closes, then, you know, we're going to have to move into January and the new administration and, and, and try again in January. Um, you know, I, I do believe eventually we'll get there. I just don't know how quickly they're going to be able to act, but that's what we're pushing for is we feel that the, the best possible way to get additional funding into the owner into the owner's hands is through the federal government. And do I think life is going to go back to normal? Not really. Um, you know, I think that we're going to come out of this. I think that, you know, the vaccine is coming and that that's going to really change things and, and start to get this under control. But um, do I think it's gonna go back to January, 2020 anytime soon? No, I really don't. I think I think this has changed us. And again, I, I go back to what Andy said, you know, hopefully we can find ways to change it for the better. I think that's the important thing to focus on is how do we change it for the better as we come out of this? Thank you, Melissa. I'll mention too for some of the restaurants that are on this, if you've had some success in some of these items um, that you have tried out during COVID, definitely let us know so we can share them with other folks on the call. Um, one comment came in is some of a lot of the funding available just keeps putting us deeper in debt. How do we avoid things like taking money out of our retirement to pay for things? I think if you can connect with an SBDC advisor, um, we may be able to take a look at current situation and work with you to look at how you might be able to improve revenue streams, increase marketing, to kind of pivot, right, with the, the, the challenges that you're facing. So that is one service that is available to you free of charge. SBDC's advisors are here to help you look at some numbers. We're not gonna tell you what to do, but we will help provide information and help you look at data and financials in particular so you can make the best possible decision for yourself. Um, so connect with your local SBDC. You can go and I'll, actually I can show our next slide with the contact information. If you go to newyorksbdc.org, you can request an appointment. And um, once you've completed that form, an advisor will follow up with you. And again, everything we talk about is completely confidential 
one-on-one, -on -one, we are here to work and assist you um, with whatever it is that you want to talk about in terms of your business. Absolutely. Thank you, Angela. I put uh, in the chat the list of our locations so folks can check that oh, thanks, out there. And most of our centers are working remotely, so most of those uh, appointments will be virtual. So folks should know that and feel comfortable in that. Um, we got to thank you, Angela, for all the hard work uh, in the panel. Thank you. This is a, it's a tough situation for sure. Um, that might have been the last question, Angela. I'll turn things over to you to let folks uh, have any last words if you'd like. Well, for me, I just want to thank everybody that attended today and Melissa, Christy, Dan, Andy, Renee, couldn't do it without your technical support. So I think it's, you know, we're not all in the same boat, but we're all in choppy waters. So I think, especially here in the North Country, we do it so well, we come together, we work together, we're creative, and the restaurant industry is just so creative. It's what we do. So um, if there are things you would like us to work on, please let us know uh, in terms of you know future programming, whether it's help to get your business online, more social media campaigns about shop local and cool things that are happening in our area. Um, we're here to support you. Let us know, please, um, what it is that we can add uh, to what we're already doing to make it a better experience. So absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day, and I'm sure we'll be talking real soon.